Hello there, this is Earl Furi, host of your favorite human interest show, hashtag The African Dream. Today, we have for our special guest, Marek Kofi Gan. He's also known as Kofi Ghana. He is a Ghanaian management consultant, chartered accountant, public speaker, book author, and an aspiring presidential candidate of Ghana. In 2019, Mr. Gan announced his intention to run for president of Ghana as an independent candidate. In August of 2020, he left the coalition of independent political aspirants to run on his own campaign based on what he described as a flawed process leading to Kofi Kranting being chosen as the lead candidate going into the December polls. He launched his manifesto and campaign at the Alisa Hotel in Accra, Ghana. In October 2020, his party's nomination was disqualified by the Electoral Commission of Ghana for technical reasons. He challenged his disqualification by the EC, but was subsequently dismissed by an Accra High Court. Welcome to the African Dream Show, Mr. Gunn. Thank you, Mr. Furry. Thank you, Aura. Really it's a pleasure, pleasure, pleasure to have you here. Um, how's your day been so far? Uh, I've been working all day, so it's been, uh, it's been a full day, uh, but I enjoy what I do anyway, so yeah. It's good. So how about you? It's been well. It's, uh, it's been well. The weather is a little overcast here in North Carolina, but okay. you know we're taking it easy and hoping for the best. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. So now let's um, delve into this um, conversation. Um, what are some of the things that informed your decision to run for the seat of president in Ghana? Well, I, I think in a large part, I, I, I got to a point like everybody else, you know, uh, you voice out what you need to voice out when you see things going wrong. Uh, but up to a point, you realize it, it wouldn't just take voicing things out. You do need to get in there. Uh, get your hands and your boots dirty. And so for me, at, at a point, I think around 2018, 2019, I, I felt, you know what, we, we can't keep talking about this. Uh, we do need to get in there and, and, and hold the ropes and get things done. So it was more something I saw as a duty rather than uh, something motivational. I, I just thought, you know, as a Ghanaian citizen, you know, Ghana has done a lot for me. Uh, and this was the time it needed us most. And, and we all needed to get in there. So that's that's the reason why. That. More of a duty, yeah. responsibility than um, something motivational. Um, you, so you went as far as almost getting your name on the ballot <laughs> box, but then got disqualified, as I had read in your um, introduction earlier on. Yeah. Well, uh, this qualification in quotes, but yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, they 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 gave the reason for well on the basis of technicality. But um, how did that make you feel, having gone that far? Well, you see, if if this was um, if this was uh, my fight alone, then it would have been a lot easier to swallow because then it's just me. Um, but this was. This was the dream of everybody else who was supporting this agenda. This was the dream of people who thought uh, for the first time we would get a credible candidate outside of the NDC and the NPP. Uh, so for me, that is what weighed a lot more on my shoulders is the fact that, you know, it wasn't just me disqualified. It was the dreams of other Ghanaians thrown into the bin. And, and, and that for me uh, made it a lot more painful than um, than it normally would have. So, so yes, it was it was this happening. Uh, I remember we spent an, another month after the disqualification, actually calling individual people and calming them down. People's parents, uh, young folks themselves. Uh, so it was it was really uh, touching to see that we had, to some extent, made some really uh, big impact on people's lives and their hopes and aspirations for this country. Uh, so, so yeah, it was it was painful. Tell me, that creates an impression that you uh, felt like it was an unfair disqualification. Why do you feel so? Well, I mean, you, you know, when I get asked this question, I, I like to say what the facts are and let people judge for themselves. So the EC took our, you know, our uh, nomination form, uh, congratulated us, and off we went. The, the normal procedure, as according to the EC's own rules, was that they would uh, uh, go through the documentation and then give us a copy, a signed version, a verified version of a copy, so that 
you know, we know that the same copy we have is the same copy they have, even though we have our copy. Um, that never happened. Six months down the line, even after the whole process, we still not got our copy. Um, and then the EC came out subsequently and said, you know, they had informed us, blah, 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 and that on the grounds of IT, we are qualified, but on the grounds of other, you know, technicalities, we had been disqualified. And one of them was that our signatures appeared similar, whatever that meant. Um, and interestingly, the EC, I had been in communication, and I have proof of this. I had been in communication with the EC for that entire one week or two weeks. It took them to make that decision. And not one single time did they call me or email me or write to me or call any of my team members uh, to tell them there was an issue. Uh, subsequently, we went to see the EC. You had conversation. It took a bit of back and forth. Uh, they wouldn't budge. Uh, but we got to know from the EC itself that others had been called in and, and, and had conversations with. So the question then become, why not us? What, what happened to us? Uh, so we took the EC to court, obviously. Um, and court itself was interesting. You know, uh, a lot of things happened. It took a while for us to even get into in the front of a judge. Um, I wouldn't make any allusions to that. But the documents that formed the basis of the EC's arguments were never even presented in court. Um, the so-called CID report that formed the basis of their judgment was never presented in court. Uh, there was no evidence from any officer, uh, and yet the judge still ruled that, you know, uh, everything was in the favor of the EC. And, 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 and I, for me, I just, you know, I say these things and I ask Ghanians, you know, you be the judge if you think that was a fair process, you know, then for you it is a fair process. I, I did not think it was a fair process. In your opinion, um, do you feel that Ghana is ready to break that jinx of what we seem to have as a two-party political system between the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and the new patriotic you know, party, the current MPP government of Ghana? <laughs> That's a big question. I mean, uh, I mean we could sit here and argue about the, the possibilities all day, but I do think it's possible. Um, I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is that the, the, the political system, the terrain here has been hugely monetized. Um, and so it'll take quite a bit to, to undo all that. Uh, what I do believe can happen is if we citizens, people like you and I decide that, you know what, we do need to take this bull by the horns and, and all of us go out there and make this happen, then it can be possible. Uh, but if we are expecting that every now and then one person will get on the platform there and try to shake the status quo a little bit, um, that's not gonna happen. So I, I think whether it happens or not really depends on us, you know, whether we do want it to happen, you know, uh, uh, enough. If, if we do want it enough, then yes, it can happen. And it can happen very easily because look, um, I, have, I have been privy to seeing uh, regimes fall outside of Ghana that were much more standing on stronger pillars than just, you know, the democratic uh, pillars that we have here. So it, it would take us, the citizens, the young people, the younger generation. And indeed, as I have learned, a lot of the old folks who actually think that they have, they have made a mistake uh, throughout their lives in allowing these two uh, 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 bulls to, to, to run this country down for as long as they have. It's just incumbent on a willingness and a desire yeah. by the people to want yeah. uh, to break yeah. that jinx. Um, it will take us a critical mass of us, yes. Right, right. Let me ask you, um, based on your experiences um, from running uh, for the seat of presidency, what are some of the lessons that you've learned um, that you feel like would help you, assuming you want to give it another shot? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's... Uh, it's not only my lesson. I think it's a lesson for anybody who, you know, uh, one of the things I'm doing this is that even if it doesn't happen with me, that some young folks out there would take inspiration from it and, 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 and do it. You know, we, we all build on each other's shoulders. And so I'm, I'm seeing this way beyond myself. But I think one of the critical things that 
I learned is to be to be prepared mentally, psycho. It takes a lot of uh, psychological wit uh, to be able to get focused and not mind the insult because you're gonna get a lot of that. Uh, to get focused and not get you know the stones being thrown at you. I don't mean physical stones, but uh, all, everything that's gonna be thrown at you. You you need a huge level of uh, uh, resoluteness mentally to be able to deal through all of that because once you once you shake at any point that you're gone it, it's it's quite easy like that so that for me is one personal decision you've got to make um, uh, but the other thing you need to bear in mind is it's going to cost you um, it's going to cost you your career it's going to cost you family at some point uh, it's going to cost you an awful lot. It's very lonely at the top, and, and you need to be mentally psyched up to uh, to deal with that. Um, but then, on a bigger on a bigger scale, you do need to know what you're offering. Um, this is no, it's not kids' play. Because um, I remember when we were dealing with our manifesto, for example, it took over 100 people. Uh, ten per the various sectors that we were looking at, uh, and these were not ordinary people. These were really uh, accomplished people, putting them together, uh, you know, across the world, and getting them to think and getting them to put their brains at work. So, it's 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 also you know your ability to pull people together and inspire them to know that you know this is something that we all should be a part of. So. There's, there's a lot to there's a lot to share about this, um, but but these are some of the highlights. And I think one of the other bigger things you need to keep in mind doing this is that uh, don't get too fixated on money. I, I know the system is very monetized and all that, but uh, focus on the efficiency. You know, um, I'm not saying don't let money not play a role. Money plays a big role in this, and this is one of the biggest lessons we have learned as well is that you need money. Even, even in respective of the efficiency, you do need an awful lot of money. So, um, so keep those things in mind, you know, the money is needed, but, but try and focus also on the efficiency because that, that is the only advantage any newcomer has that the two big ones don't have. They've played this game with money for so long that they've lost track of the need to be efficient in doing things. And, and if you can focus on both, uh, some money and some uh, efficiency, you, you can't go far. You, you might have heard of it or probably not, but um, accuse you of being too proper. Like um, sometimes politics is a dirty game and, you know, you, you, you just have to, you know, show your head and, you know, know uh, let the people know that, yeah, you, you can play dirty sometimes, but people, uh, some people were like, you are too proper, you know. Um, uh, what do you have to say to that? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I think it, this is all about perspectives, isn't it? Um, I mean, we see how politics is played in other places and we admire it, you know. And we say, oh, look at how their politics is so clean. It does not mean they're not dirty. Um, so it really depends on how you want to play politics. Um, if, if people are saying, oh, let him get dirty, we've seen dirty for 30 plus years. The question is, what has it gotten us? You know, so if we want to still play daddy, yes, it's not like I'm an angel. I am not. I'll be the first one to tell you I am not. And those who know me know I'm not an angel. But there is also different ways of playing this kind of game. You know, uh, you can be, you can, you can decide to be the leader that people can look up to and aspire that. I wish our politics would be better this way. And then you can also have people in your team or your follower who do the dirty game for you. So, you know, the leader does not always have to be out there in the mud because, look, at the end of the day, this is not just politics. You're trying to also inspire people to see a different way um, of doing things. And so, you know, it, it, those are hard choices you have to make. I chose to be uh, the version that people can aspire to. And even if they don't get there, at least it makes our politics just a little bit cleaner than it currently is, you know. Um, so so the most are personal choices I've had to make. But let nobody be under any influence. My team will tell you I am a hard nut to crack. Um, 
in terms of getting people on their toes. And for me, you know, being disciplined is a lot more crucial to me than being dirty. It's not what Ghana needs right now. We don't need another dirty, you know, politician. What we need is a really disciplined person. And, and that's what I, I, that's what I was selling. But, um, <laughs> yeah, folks, my name is Oral Furi. You're watching Hashtag The African Dream. We have for our special guest today, Mr. Marik Kofi Gan, one-time presidential aspirant. Now, Mr. Gan, um, tell us, if you had the um, power or the um, opportunity to recommend or suggest changes in Ghana's electoral laws and, you know, um, uh, rules that uh, governs electioneering in Ghana, what will be some of the things that you would recommend or want to see changed and why? Very simple. Let the EC do its work. So there the, are all these recommendations we come up with, and I totally agree with most of them. I've attended uh, several uh, fora where, you know, these recommendations have come uh, and all that, and I accept all that. But even the basics that are currently there, I'll give you an example. Get all parties, registered parties, to, to have audited financial accounts every single year. That in itself will tell us where they are getting their funding from and how they are spending it. We don't even do that regularly. So if something as basic as that was being um, properly enforced, God knows we probably wouldn't have had more than five parties in last year's election. So if we can't even get the basic, you know, structures that are there to function the way they've been put out there, then, you know, and, and that for me has always been the struggle is that, you know, Ghana is not uh, lacking the, the laws that need to be there for us to function. It's the discipline to make those laws function that have always been our problem. Same with the constitution, you know, same with every other, every other sector you take a look at. So, you know, the starting point for me is let the EC be as independent as it's intended to be and let the EC do its work and enforce what it needs to enforce. Uh, if we were doing that, I don't think on a yearly basis you have more than three or four parties, you know, running for office. But I, yes, I agree other things need to be shaped up. One of them is the, is the, is the financing rule. Uh, and with people have come up with different, you know, approaches to that. You know, do we put a cap on how much you can spend per constituency or at the national level? Uh, do we put a cap on, you know, how many? So there's all these things that are in the pipeline that we all know about, but wouldn't do because it doesn't favor uh, the big guys playing in the pool. Thank you, Mr. Gunn. Thank you. Um, recently, uh, sometime um, in the uh, first quarter of um, 2020 in Ghana, there was this um, um, demonstration that was planned that gained a lot of traction online with the hashtag fix the country. Um, obviously, um, it was um, um, brought into being by mostly Ghanaian youths who were disgruntled and dissatisfied with what they felt was unfair treatment from government. And they were simply asking for what they felt and know was rightfully theirs. Um, in, in, in a functioning democracy that, you know, they needed to be provided with to enable them at least live decent lives. They were asking for the bare minimum. Um, like I said, it gained traction, um, but along the line, it lost steam. Um, what do you think accounted for that? I, you know, I'm not part of the team. So, you know, you need to be at the back of the, uh, the driving wheel to know, you know, where the fault is coming from on the dashboard. But um, I, I do know about the uh, fix the country uh, movement. Uh, it's it's taking various variants now, fix the country now and all that. But um, one of the things I I said when it started was a, a man cannot give you what he does not have. Uh, and I'm not talking about a man as in a human being, but we are in a way, and I like to be critical about issues, not, not just for critical sake, but so we can, we can deal with the real things that need to be dealt with. You know, we're, 
effectively asking uh, two brothers who have not been able to solve a household problem for 30 years to get back on their feet and get it solved. I, I just don't see how that's going to happen. Because, you know, my, my basic concepts or analogy about this was if they could have, they would have done it in the first 10, 20 years, not 30. You know, and especially so when if they haven't done it for 30 years, you know, we, I, I wonder how we can expect them to do it in three. You know, so um, I am happy for one thing, though, uh, that that movement has shown that Ghanaians are indeed ready to not only shake the tables, but break some of the legs under the table, because we need a whole new set. That's, that's what really is. Um, our compatriots have done what we are asking, and, and, and they are right, the barest minimum. Uh, our compatriots, name them, you know, Rwanda, Kenya, South Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, name them. They each have done this in no more than 25 years. And so if we've clocked 30 and we're still asking for the barest minimum, and I'm happy you use that term, then the problem is not us. The problem is, you know, those who, who run the system and they need to be changed. So um, I just pray, one of my biggest prayer is that this momentum does stay on all the way to the, uh, to the end of, 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 uh, of the period uh, getting into 2024. I pray. You mentioned uh, that the Ghanaian uh, youth or Ghanaians in general are ready to shake the table and if necessary, break some of the legs under that table. Um, I have had the opportunity to speak uh, with a cross section of youths, um, especially in Ghana. And what I keep hearing over and over is we have tried. Every time we try and we're close to moving that table, we're clamped down. So I get the impression they feel boxed in and they have all the excuses to justify that feeling. How do you encourage them? This is about the hardest question I have ever been asked. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is about the hardest question because, because I actually feel the same. And so that question is a, is a true reflection of uh, a sort of platform that we find ourselves, not only as people who want a change to happen, but also as citizens, you know. Um, but here's what I, I have to say to folks. You know, I, I am... I am a Voltarian, I'm an Anglo, you know, and I, I like to share this little story. When, when my ancestors um, had to flee from uh, Togbia Gokoli in Moche, uh, the folklore we have is that our ancestors were held in a compound bound by walls and the only way they could escape was that every single day they cooked, every single day they washed their clothes, whatever water they had access to, they kept pouring it at the wall until, uh, you know, the cementing got soft enough to be chiseled out with their nails and whatever have you. Uh, eventually, that wall got uh, broken through and they got a passageway to flee and, and, and come down to what they are currently settled as Anglos. And so I take inspiration from that. Yes, it's an old story of what my ancestors did, but even today it, it resonates, is that every little chipping at that table would eventually get some of those legs to, to wobble. And, and eventually break. And so we cannot stop. We cannot stop talking. There are, my, 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 my close associates will tell you uh, the number of times I have said to them, you know what, 
no more. My doctors will tell you how many times they have told me, hey, keep your pressure down. You need to look after yourself. And I'll say yes, get into an exercise regime. And then it stares back at you and you're back at it. Bang, bang, bang. So we can't stop talking. We can't stop conscientizing people. We have to. The more of us that get conscientized, you know, the better we know that that wall is breaking. So we can only keep going. Coming from us said, the only way is forward. Forward. We look neither east nor west. We face forward. This is Earl Furi speaking, and you're watching Hashtag The African Dream, your favorite human interest chat show we have for our very special guest, one-time independent presidential candidate of Ghana, Mr. Marek Kofi Ghana. Mr. Ghana, tell us, what Ghana do you want for yourself and your posterity? Very easy question. <laughs> I dream of this every single day. I Look, I, I just want one Ghana, a Ghana in which all any Ghanaian needs to make progress in life is one dream and one willingness to work at it. And this country should be able to nurture every single dream to fulfillment for every single Ghanaian. You know, um, and, and that's that's the that's the basic any any citizen can ask for in any country. And so I, I just want us to build a Ghana that wherever you are in Ghana, it doesn't matter in whatever village you are, as long as you have a dream to become something, and as long as you're willing to work at that dream. Uh, this country should be able to support you to make it happen. Because if it happens for one of us, it happens for all of us. Uh, and, and that is one dream that should permeate through this generation and every other generation. Um, in terms of what it would take, it would take every single one of us. I can't stress that enough. You know, if every single one of us would stop being it all about party and being it all about how can we all become better, then we will get somewhere. Then we will get somewhere. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think a bigger burden lies on, you know, those of us who are professionals and who are capable, because that is what this country needs right now. Capable people, uh, who have proven to be able to uh, to do, not just talk, to do, uh, who can stand and say, you know what, no more about politics. This is about Ghana. If we can get to that point, or even close to that point, we would have we would have been able to do something major for this country. So, for those watching, um, especially that might be interested in supporting your candidature, assuming you give it one more shot again, how do they connect with you? Where do they go to, you know, let known their support for you or maybe contribute to your, you know, dreams and aspirations? Well, you, you, you put that very rightly, you know, it, it all depends on how this goes and whether we want to, um, but uh, we, we're going through a, a phase right now, uh, right after, uh, 2020, we decided to do a lesson learning process and, and determine what, what is the best way uh, to do this uh, and whether it is now. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm available on every social media platform. Marit Gan, type it in any social media platform, I'll pop up. Uh, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Facebook. Uh, we have a website called uh, uh, ganforgana.com. Um, and that's still very active, I believe. So uh, we're pretty much everywhere. As, as long as you're typing the name, then it, it should come up. Um, but yeah, um, let's let's all pull through together. That's what it's going to take. Let's all pull through together. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gunn. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And we wish you all the best in your political endeavors. Great. Right.